Special Justice Group and others and Andrew Von Ferris have called an exploration as to how we might contribute to the working through of these ideas. I'm delighted to uh, introduce uh, uh, Dr. Kennedy Graham, uh, who, um, yeah, I said, we have known each other for a number of years. <laughs> um, uh, Kennedy was a very good friend of my brother, uh, who was five years younger than I. They were in the same class at school, and they stayed very close friends, for goodness knows, sort of 60 years. Um, so that's brilliant. Kennedy, we, we appreciate um, all of your insights that you've gained from your experience, uh, and so we look forward to, um, to what you have to present to us. Um, the expectation is that um, Kennedy will speak for some 40, 45 minutes or so, and then we'll look forward to having a discussion. Uh, but the idea is that we will certainly close on somewhere, well, I suppose it depends on the discussion, somewhere around 7 15, certainly no later than 7 30. Um, it is possible that uh, we might uh, be able to welcome the Minister, James Shaw, who um, has indicated he certainly hopes to be able to attend a uh, given parliamentary procedure. Um, sometimes that's possible, sometimes it's not. Kennedy, over to you. Thank you. <coughs> you're right. Uh, you're right. And, uh, thank you, Barry, uh, and thank you to all of you for the invitation to, to come tonight. Um, and my wife, Marilyn, at the back there is with me, and uh, we are delighted to be here. It's uh, certainly not the first time we've been in St Andrews. Um, and we, we have been calling ourselves Wellingtonians for uh, quite a long time. Um, but we have to confess that we just sold our apartment um, in Wellington a month ago, almost more or less to the day. And we're on Waiheke, um, where we've had a house for a long time. And now we're 100% we're Waihekeans. Um, for the month, we're down here at Wellington uh, uh, for a couple of days. And so it's delightful to be here. And thank you again. Um, and, and Barry had um, approached me and said, would I um, pick up the issue of the climate draft advice paper? And um, very happy uh, analysis, and, analysis and commentary. Um, to state the obvious, I am in my personal capacity, which is pretty much the only capacity I have. Um, I, I'm a member of the board now of the New Zealand Centre for Global Studies, which is a charitable trust. Um, mostly professors, academics on, on the board. It's been going since 2013. I was the director for eight years until 1 January this year, and I'm pretending to be an associate at Victoria University, but um, uh, we'll be coming down to Wellington from time to time, I'm, I certainly hope. So I'm delighted to explore it and the form to know just how much detail to go into, and especially, it will not be lost on you, um, first personal comment, I think climate change, uh, I did half of my career on nuclear disarmament and, and the second half of my career on climate change. And I don't think there has been anything other beyond climate change that is more complex uh, and challenging and of course existential in its central importance to the future of humanity. <laughs> so there's a little challenge. Um, to know how much detail to go into and how much to come to the surface, but we'll, we'll explore our way. And we'll kick off with the um, riveting uh, exposition from UNEP, UN Environment, uh, which puts out an annual report on the emissions gap. And we're not talking about 2050 here, we're talking about 2030. Uh, obviously, it has implications for 2050, and the two are very closely related. That will be a theme through tonight. And that's the emissions gap, which is the gap between the, um, uh, firstly, the current baseline, secondly, the pledges, and they, some of them are conditional and some of them are unconditional, so it immediately gets complicated. The plunging line as to what is required in terms of billions of tons of CO2 equivalent, and I presume we all know all gases and CO2 equivalent, CO2 is the main gas, but it's all other gases can be equivalent, so we get a comparable figure for, based on a 100-year time period, by and large. 
And so you would be going, well, there's the two degrees gap between current policies, pledges, and what's required. Put by 2030. And there's two, there's one is 2030, one is 2025. And both of those have two. Um, uh, two degrees and 1.5 degrees. So that gives you an idea. And the short story here is that, and we're concentrating on 1.5, because at Cancun in 2010, uh, two degrees came in as the global goal. That was 2010. In 2015, it was two degrees. We will do two degrees and pursue efforts for 1.5 degrees. And subsequent to 2015, in 2016, and thereafter, and especially in 2018, when the IPCC produced its 1.5 degree report, the focus is on 1.5. Because as the years go by, the more we begin to realize it's going to go down. And it's got to be more and more ambitious. And so it's 1.5 is the one we're looking at here, and that's the one that the New Zealand government has adopted in its Amendment Act, the Zero Carbon Amendment Act uh, in 20, um, 2019. So that's the figure there for 1.5, uh, 2020, the gap. And uh, the short story is that it's between 23 and 27 gigatons gap between what we say we're going to do as 197 states parties and what the requirement is. So we've got a long way to go. There, we're going up and up and up, and we're going to go down, down, down 2030, and then off to 2050 here. <clears throat> so that's the global context in which every country, with its common but differentiated uh, responsibilities, CBDR, and the latest phrase, different national circumstances. And we won't go into the diplomatic nuances of those, but those each, each country has to look at that and, um, and, and just decide where it sits in improving, quote, the highest possible ambition, country by country, according to different national circumstances. So that's the global context. And we now will start to look at New Zealand. And the overview, we'll look at the report, our description and analysis. We'll look at the broader context in which the report uh, sits, both the scientific context and the political context, and the conclusions, uh, some conclusions. And then we'll go into and this stuff here is, is really very much my own thinking taken from the report and the context application of principles and the results of the principles applied for our current targets. <laughs> so the report, the description of the report. Now I don't know how much you've had a chance to look at the report. Um, the, we look at the time frame, the terms of reference and the content of the report. Um, and as we can see it came out, well the evidence report came out on 26 January. It's, it's only 650 pages, and um, just in, if that's not enough, there is a database that, on which the evidence report sits. And if you want to go to the database, um, come with me, um, but, but have deep sea diving equipment. Um, and, um, and then the draft report came out uh, on 31 January, it's 180 pages, and it's, it's, re it's, it's readable. Um, I found it riveting, I, I kind of dream about it. Consultation is is now one for every, tw as of this morning, 28 March, 28 March. It was 14, got another two weeks. Yes. And then the final report, the commission, in the light of consultation, the, the commission will come out with the final report on 31 May. And that's the commission's <coughs> advice to the minister, not to parliament, to the minister. And so it's very much the executive branch. And that was the point of critique at the time of the Act, whether it should be to the Parliament or to the Minister. It was decided to keep it to the executive. You, you can argue it both ways. Um, but rest assured, the Minister then is obliged to uh, table it in the House. And, and, and in, just like it's based very much on the UK precedent, and for good reason, back in 2008, the British really led the way with their Act uh, cross-party, conservative, Labour, and have the most extraordinarily capable, 
constitutional legislative procedure for interaction between the, the, what they call the committee and the parliament, the government, the parliament, back to the committee, back and so on. And we can explore that. But the, the New Zealand one is, is sitting and reflecting pretty closely, not, not identical, but closely enough to the British one. So from May to December, it's with the minister and the government. And they have to, if they, if they disagree, they have to explain publicly why on the British president. And the commission gets a chance to respond. And it's all public. And then uh, ultimately, the decision rests with the minister and obviously the cabinet, the government, to emerge with, whoops, with the emissions reduction plan for 31, uh, on 31 December for the future. Now this is a terms of reference for the commission and it's all resting on the on the 2019 act um, section 5x3 uh, gets worse than that uh, six budgets the commission is obliged to produce first three budgets 21 2021 to 2035 one four year two five year budgets um, by the end of this year, um, or well, the government is. Uh, a fourth, which will be 2020, uh, 2036 to 2040. And this is quite important and worth noting. So we have to have that fourth budget by 2025, or the Commission does. And that's not a long way away. So if we think we need to improve everything, bear in mind that within four years, we have a chance, and so does the Commission, to do that. And then the fifth by, uh, so that's 2041 to 2045 by 2030, and then the sixth one, which takes it up to 2050 by 2035. And that also reflects, in a way, the British system. Section 5.1. Five, five now, here's where it starts getting um, interesting. And funny. The words are the budgets and the annual figures, expressed as a net quantity of CO2, carbon dioxide equivalent, all six gases expressed in the one. So that's pretty critical to pick up on as a point of departure, and must include all greenhouse gases. So all six expressed in that CO2E figure. <coughs> Section 5Z, the budget, and the, which essentially reflects the target, must be, quote, domestic as far as possible. In other words, our own domestic mitigation, net mitigation. Um, offshore mitigation, quote, if significant change of circumstances only, which is pretty healthy. You can, a personal view, you can make it tougher than that, but that's how the Act is saying it right now. Section 5 today. How to re this is the Commission, must advise to the Minister how to realistically meet the budgets and quote, ultimately the 2050 target. Note that phrase, a single 2050 target. That's significant, two. So 5Q1, the 2050 target requires that. This is the wording, requires that. Long-lived gases should be net zero. Short-lived gases, which effectively is biomethane from agriculture and waste, will be between 24 to 47 percent of 2017 figures by 2050. So those are colloquially spoken of as sub -targ well, targets or sub targets. I prefer to say they're two components of the target for reasons that might become clearer. Um, section 5S. Review, this is the commission, review that, and this is critical. Review the 2050 target when preparing the fourth budget. Fourth budget <coughs> by 20, in other words, in 2025, the Commission and therefore the government and the people of New Zealand will be reviewing that 2050 target that the government has put in place in the 2019 Act, subject to review in 2025. That's also critical. Though that's the statutory obligation of the Commission to advise the Minister Independent of those obligations, the Minister has discretion to ask for government reports, and he has already asked for two ancillary reports. 
Two, uh, so matters related, this is the phrase, matters related to greenhouse gas emission reduction. So he has chosen to say, can you, can the commission please advise me on, quote, eventual reductions needed in biogenic methane? So your 24 to 47 here is in the 2019 Act for 2050, and he's saying already, please advise on eventual, eventual reductions needed. And that's a pretty clever admirable political judgment to make in the 2019 Act and, 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 and acted immediately in terms of asking the Commission. Secondly, review the 2030 uh, national de, de, um, nationally determined <coughs> contribution in DC. In other words, your, your current 2030 target of, by New Zealand already should be reviewed. Um, and that's uh, because, because that target preceded the 2019 Act. It was a separate target in 2015 at Paris. So it's five years old already. So the content of the report, we'll look at quickly at the elements, scenarios, modeling, statistics, and conclusions. Someone can tell me when I'm getting close to 40 minutes, Barry, um, when, I'm, yes. when you want me to. Give me five minutes. Or 15. Yeah. 15. Okay. Um, so let's go through the elements. So there are two components, this is what I'm saying, two components of the 2050 target. Net zero LL long lived gases, which is basically primarily um, carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide, and the short lived gas, largely biogen biogenic methane, cut, as we said earlier, 24 to 47%. Now, here's where the Commission starts doing its own work. It has come up with four scenarios. Headwinds, behavior, technology, tailwinds. Within the scenario range, which is that one, headwinds and tailwinds, bounded by headwinds, tailwinds, equals your scenario range. Within that scenario range, one pathway. They have done already. Uh, that, and we'll say that uh, later, the, 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 the one pathway at the moment, uh, in terms of budgets, only goes out to 2035, but they kind of imply it doesn't take, you don't have to do too much to see how it's going to be in 2050 as well. They have given six pieces of advice, as they call it, in four categories, budget level, process policies, and what is time critical policies and what are necessary policies. We won't go into that right now. And 17 critical actions. The scenarios, it, they kind of speak for themselves. The headwinds, one is the tough one, higher barriers to technology and behavior change, Conserv conservative improvements only in technology beyond the current policy reference case, and modest change in behavior by all of us. Technology goes better. New technologies develop faster, available more sooner. Behavior, uh, these are more upbeat, but selectively so. Behavior change in people, business preferences, behavior change, conservative tech progress as in headwinds, but some barriers to adoption of the existing technology. And then tailwinds, which is the most optimistic scenario, both technological and behavior change, potential upper bound for how far and how fast beyond the current policy reference. So the, com whoops. So the commission has selected the lowest and the highest for its scenario its range, and then plotted one 2050 pathway within that range out to 20. 35, and then develop the three budgets, four years, five years, five years, to 2035, based on the pathway. So that's the conceptual stru structure of what they've done. They have obviously employed consultancies, Motu, uh, people in, some of you will know this, uh, people in Wellington, um, a very highly regarded consultancy group, and Vivid in the UK, who we in, when we in Parliament on our cross-party group, um, very similar in a way to, to, to Motu, uh, we contracted Vivid to do our 2017 report, and they're superb. They've both been involved with the Commission as consultancies. Three different models. We won't go into great uh, detail on this. If, uh, computer General Equilibrium Model, GCE, and ENZ, which is environment, the use of the land use in New Zealand, and the distributional impact model. And we uh, will spare ourselves delving too much into that. Um, 
st the statistics. Now, this is um, this is pretty critical in its own way because the CO2 figures are based on the 2007 fourth assessment report of the IPCC using GWP, Global Warming Potential Metric Values, for translating the other five gases into, into carbon dioxide, CO2. So the other five gases are figured as CO2 equivalent. And the metric values for doing that are based in the 2007 AR4. However, eight years later, the fifth assessment report has done new metric values in light of the advancement of science. Nothing is simple. Uh, but they're still mercifully using the GWP 100, which is basically means a 100-year time frame. So the global warming potential over 100 years of a gas emitted today. Um, and it's coming in, so the, the AR5 new metric values are coming into force in 2021, according to UN decision making. So the final report of the Commission, they say, in 31 May this year, will actually not reflect the metric values they're using in the draft report, but new metric values. And the value, and the, the critical thing here is that the value for methane is actually, interesting enough, more potent in the new one, 28, than 25. So in other words, one metric ton of methane is, will not be equal to 25 metric tons of CO2, but 28. Um, the others, one or two other gases, will be slightly less potent. One or two other gases, slightly more potent. But they're, they're very at the margin only. This is the one that's given New Zealand's system of, what is it, 47% methane, uh, thereabouts. So this is the critical one for New Zealand. The, the AR5 metric is actually going to be more, more potent, which makes it more difficult for New Zealand to be seen to be reducing in CO2 equivalent. And that's significant. Um, and then there's a new metric uh, that has come out in the last, depending on when you start reading about it, five years ago. And certainly in the last year, GW, that's, that's a mistake. It's not GWP 100, it's GWP asterisk. That's what's there. And it's being driven by experts pretty much around the world, especially in the UK and New Zealand. And, um, but it is not, and, and you know, we can go into it, but not endorsed by the UN's IPCC. So they, there's no question that for some time, if not permanently, we'll be using AR5. Okay, so now we get into the statistics, uh, and here is the, the target. Um, in the act, and it's expressed in terms of two cuts, 34, so long-lived gas is zero in both cases, Short-lived gases, 24% cut and one cut up between 24 and 47. Therefore, you convert those, and these are my own figures, but you convert those, that, into CO2E. That's pretty much already in CO2E. Uh, not, uh, nitrous oxide can be converted. CO2 is already there. You convert that one, and you get 26 megatons. Megatons, net megatons CO2E. 18 for the more ambitious one, so you're going from 69 gross down to uh, 18 net and 26 net. That's the range that in terms of CO2 equivalent that is in the legislation target for 2050. Now the Commission, um, get, uh, it's a bit unfair to say that they're a bit coy, um, but they, this is what they've done, and these are annual figures, annual emissions. Their budgets, of course, they have their five, four and five year budgets, but these are the annual figures to give you an idea. For that five year period, four year period, 68 megatons per year, on average. For that five year period, down to 57. For that five year period, down to 45. <coughs> now, I have, this is my figure, not theirs, because Sometimes they do CO2E, and other times they insist on keeping the, the gases separate, which means you have to stay up late at night working it out. 
but my figure, which I think is pretty accurate, will be 13. So here's your range, 18 to 26 in the air, <coughs> CO2e. And they're saying the pathway that's between, kind of between the, the optimistic one and the pessimistic scenarios range will be 30. In other words, they're going to go a bit below the target, they think. But, is, but you're talking still at 2050 about 13 megatons, not net zero <laughs> greenhouse gases. Net zero long lived, but not net zero green, all greenhouse gases. That's the critical thing. That's, that's um, how do we say it? Buried um, behind the curtain or the necessary result of splitting gases. Take your choice. The conclusions of the report. Um, <coughs> interesting. And uh, to some extent, uh, optimistic. First three budgets out of two and three can be done with existing technology and purely by domestic mitigation, which is some of the better news. After 2035 to 2050, may require offshore mitigation. So they're already based on that. You can see that they're conscious of that figure. Uh, for a start, and secondly, it may not be domestic uh, beyond that 13, they have to do offshore mitigation. Second, current policies will miss, of New Zealand, will miss New Zealand's 2050 targets. Requires technological pro progress and behavioral change. Three, the current 2030 NDC is inadequate for the 1.5. That's a very important statement by the Commission. Number four, this is the thing that the Commission has determined, and, and I think rightly so, to focus on. Reduce gross emissions at source. Emphasize reduction of gross emissions. Less reliance on forestry removals than other previous scenarios. We'll look at that. And number five, um, reductions at low cost. Uh, from, from the 1990s until about 2015, 2018, it used to be least cost. You used to have these economists earnestly coming out with the least marginal abatement cost, and it was all about least cost. Um, now they've moved to low cost, and you can even argue the case on that, um, and, and I will. But those are, those are the main conclusions, as those <coughs> the, the Commission does. So, analysis of the report. Well, just very quickly on the modelling, which we are not going into in great detail. Um, it's all pretty positive. They, they had more than three. These are just the three, um, European Commission, Infometrics New Zealand, USA. Review panel endorses the model. A robust quantitative framework to support ambitious proposals. Models are sensible, used in a sensible manner, fit for purpose, albeit the purpose may evolve over time. So it's, it's, it's a good tech from independent overseas reviews of the model. The model. So, personal comment now uh, of the notes. I think it's a highly professional work by a highly professional team, both the commission, commissioners and the staff. It's, it's pretty impressive. Uh, I'm, I would have been surprised if it wasn't. Uh, certainly affirmed by external independent reviews. A major step forward from the earlier New Zealand studies most of the New Zealand studies did not ever go on to net zero. The only been two, the vivid one in 2017 in, in Parliament, the productivity one in 2018, they both aspired to net zero. Before that, not so. So you've really only got the three. Um, now, 2017, 2018, and the report, 2021. Personal view, two shortcomings. The relationship between the 2030 contribution and the 2050 target is, is a bit unclear still in the, in the Act and therefore in the Commission's work. And I suggest, and this is my little humble contribution, we need three concepts. They're kind of there, but they need to be brought to the surface and made explicit. National responsibility level, domestic mitigation level, offshore mitigation. Secondly, backcasting. If you're going to 2050, and this is what is since, since 2015 it's, uh, and, and 2016 at Marrakesh, it's all been about backcasting. So the heat on getting stuff done by 2030 
it was getting so much that they thought, well, we'll also have a target for 2050. And, and that's good. Um, it's beyond most people's and the Commission's prediction range. But in terms of scenarios and pathways, you do do it. And then you backcast to 2030 or even backcast to 2025. And you work out how you're going to get to that 2050. But you're essentially backcasting. But going through the evidence report, um, I think my view is that the first three budgets out to 2035 really depend on what your notional budgets might be for four, five, and six. Unless you say, oh, the hell with it, or whatever, whatever, it'll be offshore mitigation. But if you're going to say, we want our domestic mitigation to continue to be, quote, quote, Paris, the highest possible ambition by New Zealand, then you have to kind of do, even though you know, you're realising that your predict prediction capacity or capability is much less out there, you're still, num still having to do number crunching and take it further to make your three budgets come alive. But we can explore that. And, and one challenge, if, if we have just declared a climate emergency, then I suggest that the central methodology isn't really, shouldn't really be focusing on modeling or what's the low cost. It should be um, what, uh, and, and it, it should be, you know, how do we get there? Not what's it going to cost. Uh, it'll cost. And we find out what it's going to cost. And we prepare as a country for it. But we don't say, oh, the hell with it. We can't afford to save the planet. No. Um, and then short term mitigation, um, that's meant to be 2030, 2021 to 2030, is critical, and that has Im implications for methane. Now, don't, we won't bounce from figure to figure here. We're just going to look at the ones that count. Um, this is subject to other people, because uh, these are just my figures. Uh, well, uh, uh, one or two of them are. Um, the Vivid report, so we're comparing the three net zero pathways. Vivid's Productivity Commission, Climate Commission. And the Vivid one, the net zero, they had four scenarios, Vivid, of which net zero was the fourth. And the most, obviously the most ambitious. So without going into these figures, um, but there are one or two that are relevant, but this is their figure. 1.8 megatons in 2050, which is virtually net zero, so you call it net zero. The Productivity Commission, a year later, and with much more modeling, much bigger staff, well, these, these guys were in mostly in the, there was about a staff, they had a staff of about six. I went to London, saw them first, brought them out three times to New Zealand, they met with all the experts in New Zealand, there were about six of them. And, uh, they did a good job, but there was no modeling. Productivity Commission, I was involved as an advisor, they would have had a staff of, at a guess, from memory, 15 to 20 staff and other people uh, working on, and they did modeling. Now, they came down to a figure of 0.4, which was their, this was their scenario, um, SD0. Um, just, uh, and, and, and that was even more ambitious than, than Vivid's. And as we saw earlier, the Climate Commission one uh, is at the moment sitting at 13, which is less ambitious. Those are the three reports um, that you could say, OK, well, what's the difference between them? And we won't go into great detail, but the, the obvious, you can look at the, 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 the total um, total uh, figures and uh, especially the forestry where vivid is 30 is net removals of 36 megatons uh, in 2050 whereas productivity commission net removals of 52 megatons which is massively bigger and um, the climate commission's tailwind scenario is saying 17, which is much, far, far, far less than 52 and significantly half of vivids. So that explains quite a bit in itself um, and so on. And you can get lost in the, in the 
those figures. Features of the three pathways. The um, Climate Commission's pathway, less ambitious than Vivid or Product Productivity Commission. The distinctive features, Vivid attains more or less the 1.5 net zero, but they would quote, to do so, they close aluminium, oil and steel. Sorry. Um, the Productivity Commission attains the 1.5 net zero. This is all gases. But with that huge reliance on exotic forestry, um, that was it. The, the 52 was exotic plus native, but most of it was is exotic. The Climate Commission misses the 1.5 net zero while meeting the net zero long-lived gas target, but not the total target. So these two are more ambitious, and this one um, less ambitious, 13 instead of a 1.8 and 0.4, but we'll see where that leads us. Context, just very quickly, the Paris Agreement, we probably know this, well below increase in global average temperature, well below 2 degrees, and pursuing efforts, that's the wording, pursue efforts to limit it to 1.5. And of the IPCC report, they did 411 global scenarios, of which 53 would, would achieve the 1.5 degree goal, so that gives you an idea of the scenario planning. Uh, to choose the scenario. And it's not to denigrate it, because you do want to have options as you go through from year to year to year, decade to decade. You're going to have to alter your scenario. So that's why there are so many. The experts produce so many. Our own Act, Zero Carbon Act, derives from the 1.5 degree report. And it meets the range for carbon dioxide. It actually goes a bit further than the IPCC reports recommends for nitrous. And it kind of meets the range for methane. If you say, well, New Zealand can be in the middle of the global median for methane, which does not account for differentiation, does not account for differentiation. So we have to look into, into that, what that means. These, now, here's the legislation. The statement of objective is New Zealand will contribute to the global effort under the Paris Agreement to limit 1.5. So the obvious question, you don't have to be a linguist uh, or, or a pedant, you just have to be a normal policy planner and voter to say, well, what do you mean by contribute to the goal? Uh, my suggestion is uh, it should be proportionately meet the goal of 1.5, New Zealand proportionately meet the goal according to common but differentiated uh, responsibilities and different national circumstances. Because you can contribute one quarter of what you need to and say we contributed to the goal. And um, um, I'll be brave enough to say it, say it in front of my former colleague. Minister, um, that what that does, just saying it contributes to the goal, it won't be just him, it's the totality of cabinet and, and the government, but what that does is let ministers, and it isn't just current ministers, it's future ministers for the next 30 years, off the hook of litigation. You just prove you contributed to the goal. As opposed to, if you were obliged under legislation to proportionately meet it, you'd have armies of experts in the court, scientists, lawyers, and so on, but it would be a proper piece. That you may have seen, there's been a lot of litigation these days, the most recent one was in the Netherlands, where the court agreed with the plaintiffs that the Netherlands government is not meeting its obligation in, a, a, I think, to civil law. And it's not meeting its obligation to future generations with its current policies. And that's a binding legal determination, as I understand it, from the Dutch courts. So this wording is massively important, <coughs> politically and legally. So the answer, whether you do that or that, depends on section three, which we're getting to. Personal conclusions. These are my conclusions now, not the Commission's conclusions. 
So the, the act identifies two components, uh, long-lived and short-lived. It's composed of domestic and offshore. The, the report has 100% domestic, but the pathway is above all gases net zero uh, for 2050. Um, and, uh, and, and even though your, your early pathway will be 100% domestic, uh, by 2050, you're going to need offshore mitigation to the tune of at least 13 million. Three, the Act and the report are both vague on equity. The report is vague because the Act is vague, although you could, you could argue that the report could take it upon itself to be more precise. They cite equity as a principle, but they don't explore it in terms of what it would mean for figures, really. And so we get to the point of recommending, I do, that we need clarification on the principles and the concepts with preliminary figures. Recommendations, application of the UN principles. Now, there are principles in the report, the Commission's report. But they are, with great respect, they're principles that have guided, the, the Commission has adopted its own principles to guide it. And they're not word for word what the UN principles are in the Rio 1992 Framework Convention and the 2015 Paris Agreement. These are the main principles in the main treaties. Equity, sustainable development, quote, adequate food production, respect of capabilities and historical responsibility. Those are the four main criteria. So, um, again, my thoughts now. Uh, if you apply the UN principles and on the basis of New Zealand differentiation, one, the climate, if a climate emergency has been declared, there is urgency of action, therefore you need action in the short term. That has implications for methane, because the methane lifetime in the atmosphere is 12 years. <coughs> Whereas the, meth the atmospheric lifetime of um, carbon dioxide is in hundreds and even thousands of years, certainly centuries. So that's the, that's the difference. That's why you get suddenly politically uh, controversial about what you do about methane. Paris, bear in mind, that's point one. Point two, bear in mind that the Paris Agreement target, 1.4, only gets you to the target with 66% probability. That's another cautionary tale. Three, Paris says developed countries must take the lead, common but differentiated responsibility, different national circumstances. But those are qualifications on the overriding principles that developed countries take the lead. Four, New Zealand is among the developed countries. New Zealand has one of the highest historical responsibilities and one of the highest per capita emissions. So, if we're talking about common CBDR and differentiated national uh, um, conditions, New Zealand is right up the top in terms of, is it in the median? No. Is it in the high with developed? Yes. Within developed, it should be near the top. Which means if you've got a range, if you've got an IPCC range, we should be looking at the top of our responsibilities. So New Zealand principles suggested are equity, and uh, so we'll get on to that, historical responsibility, and you can go back to 1850, or you can do 1950, or you can do 1990. So taking the easiest one for New Zealand, even the most recent 1990, there would be a 99% reduction if you can believe that, for 2050. We'll look into that. And food production, yes, we have to, we do have to obviously help feed the global population. But in doing so, we also, personal view, or it's, it's way beyond the personal view, have to have regard for nutritional dietary change. When we're thinking, well, what are we going to do by way of our food production and our consequent emissions? And the question is whether we're doing enough of that in the Commission report. And, and short-lived gases, methane contributions over the short term. So, okay. so um, this is Oxfam, New Zealand, which has done a really interesting, you might want to look at it, a very interesting and useful report in September. A fair 2030 target for Aotearoa. So I'm just quoting from Oxfam, New Zealand here. They've, they've identified, I did do something very similar in 2015 in, in South Parliament, but this is, this is a, in a way, they, they went into more detail than I did. They've got five models 
identify five models. There are more. If they didn't use Brazil's historic responsibility model or the contraction conversions, they did five. Grandfathering, equal per capita model, population overuse model, climate action tracker model, which is a European largely based. It's a global one, very well recognized. And the, and the, and the climate equity reference project, CERP. Um, now they, I did in 2015, and they have independently in 2020 identified the CERP project as the best one, and in my view it certainly is. So here's the um, Oxfam doing a, a number on New Zealand, and we're now talking about 2030, not 2050, because they're talking about the NDCs. Uh, because this is based, all these models around the world um, are there at the moment for the 2030 NDCs, not the 2050 target. So they say um, the net uh, for grandfather would be 27, that's the easiest for New Zealand, from 65 down to 27. Per capita, 13. Population, minus 1. Sir, uh, two versions. Uh, they're not using the CAT one because they didn't do removals, that's gross, so they, and I agree, uh, the, the CERP one is 0.5 and a different modelling, uh, different criteria, this is capacity, this is capacity <coughs> plus, 1990 historic responsibility, 0.5. 99% reduction of your 1990 figure by 2030, in other words, basically taking that away completely. To, from 9, 65 down to zero. Now, they say, correctly, it can't be done. Not feasible through 100% domestic mitigation. It's, firstly, it's against the principle of a just transition, people to be out of a job, etc., etc. <laughs> and secondly, it's not low cost, not the, it's not the most efficient, it wouldn't be low cost, and it would not be the most efficient global route. So even Oxfam New Zealand is saying that if you take this extraordinarily ambitious figure of a complete reduction from 65 to zero in 40 years, it wouldn't be domestic mitigation. It would be some domestic mitigation, but not all. So, um, they, so the implication of that, I'm now inferring implications, personal recommendation. We should identify, and it's they're kind of, as I said, they're buried, but they need to be brought to the surface and made explicit. There is a thing called national responsibility level, and that's what they're talking about up here. Fair share, based on equity, and CBDR principles. But that's a figure. It's that, it happens to be that figure, according to Oxfam, based on CERF. But it's a figure. The commission explores this stuff without making it explicit and without giving those figures. They talk about equity and then they move on. And I'm not meaning to denigrate them, but I do think we have to be more explicit. Domestic mitigation level, highest possible ambition, but it is a subset of your national responsibility level. So, and then what you can't do with domestic, you do offshore. So one minus two equals three. So what you then do is you say, well, what's going to be the cost of that offshore mitigation? Because we're spending money buying credits, helping other countries through your aid program. So you, you multiply by an estimated carbon price. And then you start getting figures, both megatonnage and dollars. And, we st and for both 2030 and for 2050. So... Um, you can rely on, uh, you can start to work out what our equity national responsibility level would be, both in 2030 and 2050, what our domestic mitigation would be in 2030 and 2050, and what the offshore mitigation would be in dollar terms in 2030 and 2050. The Commission doesn't do it, but it could be done. And I'll get back onto that forestry stuff later. Here's the figure, we, we're getting towards the end now. Um, we don't have to go into this. Uh, these, these are the figures I've worked out. And what it means is that the, the, the fair share, your, um, your national responsibility level would be recognized as 0.5. 
and your domestic target is 44 um, and so if you take well how do we go from there that means that 40 but in the year 2030 43 and a half would be offshore mitigation multiply it by your let's say $50 at the moment is $35 a ton it's gone up uh, hugely to 35 and it'll continue to go up um, and the Commission and everyone else says it has to go up. Um, so if you say $50 in 2030, you're talking about $2 billion. So what you're saying is that we accept a national responsibility level of 0.5, and we can only get it down. Uh, this is the current promise to Paris, 58, <coughs> but we can get it down to 44. But we, but most of that difference, we, we acknowledge responsibility level of 0.5, and therefore, there's a lot of offshore mitigation. 2050 is a lot easier. You can argue credibly, I think, that that figure, minus 14.7, can be done by domestic mitigation, in which case, um, zero offshore mitigation. Now, it's pretty ambitious, but it's, it's, it's credible. But if it isn't, yeah. We can all argue the toss, but at least you've got a conceptual framework for having a, a discussion. Um, and there is the, the final figures, uh, by way of a summary. Um, here's the current. Here's the government under the legislation. Call that a midpoint of 20. Commissions is 13. The national responsibility level um, in, in 2050 would be minus 15, minus 15, and no offshore. And the way you get the, I'll just go back to explain how I get that particular figure. And it is saying this here. The, the PRODCOM report is, is recognised generally, including by the Commission, as too reliant on forestry, minus 52 as we know. The Climate Commission, I'm suggesting personally, is too light on forestry, minus 17. At least, that will get them the 13 megaton target, but it won't get them down further. And I think, personally, that it would do no harm to explore the relationship between the Climate Commission report and the Vivid report, which is more ambitious, less ambitious than PRODCOM, but is feasible at minus 36. So if you take 36, the difference between those two, you get, nine, you get 19, an extra, an extra 19. Oops. Um, you get an extra 19 there. And that extra 19 could be critical. Now, I'm not saying that it will be immediately apparent that the difference between their 17 and Vivid's 36, because it is complicated. It's a trade-off between land use and all sorts of argumentation, native versus exotics, forest fires if you have too much exotics, and so on and so on. It, it is complicated. And, but in pure stats, that could be done. So those are the figures, and I just suggest that it's worth looking at the relationship between these, making it more explicit, more transparent, uh, between your national responsibility level, UN principles, equity, what New Zealand can feasibly do in the tailwind scenario plus Vivid's extra forestry, and there's your offshore requirement, which could be there in 2030, but by 2050 or shortly thereafter, maybe nothing at all. So that's my recommendation.